Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, hello. Welcome to this uh, session. Hello and welcome to our online audience. We're here today together to talk about the cost of living crisis. Important topic, of course, that you've been touching uh, through different sessions here in Davos, but we will try and go into the the facts and then the solutions maybe um, with our panelists and thank you. Thank you, I will present them uh, in a few seconds. Over the course of the pandemic, uh, close to 100 million people are estimated to have fallen in extreme poverty. Uh, these people add uh, to populations who were already uh, in that state of extreme poverty before the pandemic. Now, of course, the war in Ukraine uh, is bringing high disruptions in the, uh, the price of food and fuel are creating a new uh, issue uh, in terms of cost of living crisis. At the same time, of course, uh, the wealth of the world's richest uh, people has doubled and we will uh, have the contribution of our um, of our uh, director of Oxfam here, she will talk of that, of course. So what steps can be taken uh, to tackle this uh, inequality within countries and also on an international level? That's what we will try to talk about. Uh, with me today, um, I'm pleased to introduce um, Mr. Vam Katatorian, the president of Armenia. Um, as well, uh, we have uh, uh, Mrs. Gabriela Butcher, uh, Executive Director of Oxfam International, uh, Mr. Akim Steiner, Administrator of the United Nations uh, Development Program, and Amit Stiebe, his founder and director of Vital Capital Environment, and that's an impact investment fund in Cyprus. We will have uh, about 30 minutes and then we can take some questions uh, and interact with you. So if you do have questions, please keep them and make a sign afterwards. Uh, I'll be happy to give the floor and the microphone to you. So let's jump into uh, this uh, topic. And I would start with, uh, with you, Gabriela um, Butcher. Oxfam yesterday published, uh, you published your report. Uh, as you usually do. And so if I read the, the, the figures that you gave, uh, you said uh, with this title, uh, pandemic creates new billionaire every 30 hours and a million people could fall into extreme poverty at the same rate in 2022, every um, 33 hours. So you expect this year that 263 million more people will crash into extreme poverty. Can you tell us more about those figures and the facts um, that you bring out with your reports? Yes, thank you very much. And I'm great to be here to be talking about this cost of living crisis, which is our, the name of our panel. But yes, it's definitely an inequality crisis. Um, and our report that we published yesterday as Oxfam profiting from pain, as you said, emphasizes the extreme rise in billionaire wealth during the pandemic. So it's 24 months and, um, you know, we've never seen this level of accumulation. And at the same time, uh, at the other end of the scale, we are seeing, unfortunately, such a large number. This uh, World Bank figures of extreme poverty um, that we've also uh, added um, a factor of inequality, uh, which you know, as a projection, of course, we will always uh, at the end of the year find out uh, how, unfortunately, how many people in the end um, crash into extreme poverty. But our projection is 263 million, which is unprecedented levels um, because of the rise in inequality. And now, of course, we have the impact of, of the food crisis, the hunger crisis. And we know 193 million people are in severe hunger conditions. and with uh, so many uh, impacted also now by climate change. We have a, a series of, of crises that are building on each other and, and a moment when we definitely need to think differently and act differently. And, and this is why we're here at the World Economic Forum speaking about measures that we can take and how we need to act with urgency um, in, in the face of, of so much suffering and, and so much, um, in fact, um, uh, in the end, this is causing deaths. And in, in, you know, I was six weeks ago. I was in Somalia, in, in witnessing firsthand what is happening there in terms of 
of the hunger crisis. And the Horn of Africa is experiencing its worst drought in over 40 years, compounded by this crisis uh, of climate. And, um, and inflation, plus the war in Ukraine, the, the cost of, of um, food, it's all imported. So all these situations are creating um, um, the fact that one person is, is dying in the Horn of Africa every 48 seconds. And, and if this were the only thing happening in the world, we would probably all be focusing on that uh, instead of all the other crises. So I want to bring attention to that and say, it's cost of living, yes, but we're beyond that. It's actually, we're talking about survival crisis and, and we need action. And one example of what a company can do, we projected if Walmart, which has focused so, focused so much on, on shareholder, um, if, um, you know, impact for themselves um, could um, change their their approach. And instead of paying 16 billion to their shareholders, they were to um, increase wages for their 1.6 million workers by $10,000 each. They would, you know, each benefit 1.6 million people. But in fact, that company changing their approach would reduce inequality in in the U.S. And imagine if they did that along their supply chain. So the supply chain is along th throughout the world. So we're talking about fair wages, living wages. The companies can, can have an, an impact on uh, as a matter of decision. Thank you. We'll come back to the actions afterwards. But thank, thank you very much for, for touching uh, already uh, that issue. Um, Mr. Steiner, unprecedented levels and also these inequalities, so this poverty, but also inequalities. Can you build on that? How can you uh, consider and, and qualify the situation today if you compare it historically? Well, let me pick up where Gabriela left off. I think this understanding that we are more and more clearly able to discern both from the empirical, the, the research on poverty, and its intersection with inequality, I think, is extremely important, particularly in our world of today, because um, we are in a different place than we were 100 years ago, where if there was a drought, there was no global world food program or there was no Oxfam. I mean, essentially, you either were able to become part of a diaspora or you would simply you know, either survive barely or die. And I think that, that absolute level of poverty, which is then compounded by a natural disaster, on that front, we have made quite a lot of progress over the last 100 years. And I think even as we speak today, there's roughly 100 million people who are currently receiving some form of um, uh, food aid simply because they find themselves as refugees or displaced by natural disaster. It's a, the, the humanitarian system that the world has built up is a significant safety net. But what it does not deal with ultimately is that poverty combined with inequality is actually increasingly a driver also of poverty and all that we associate with it. Let me just give you an example. You know, we're living through an extraordinary moment where food prices are exploding, energy prices are exploding. If you take an average household income on the African continent, this is a very average figure. Um, you know, on average, an African household will spend 40% of their income on food. Now imagine a poor household is probably 70, 80% of its income any increase in price fundamentally affects that household differently to somebody who has a job, who has some savings, who is able to, in a sense, weather this particular moment. Um, if it's food and fuel put together, which is you know, the two basic things that you often rely on, whether it's through electricity or you know, um, kerosene or uh, the price for transport to work with your taxis, you see an immediate multiplier taking place. So I think it's extremely important that we do look at this issue of inequality very clearly because it's actually become a major additional factor in explaining poverty in our time. Secondly, um, multidimensional poverty. Um, UNDP, many of us who work in, in the field of uh, poverty eradication have um, for many years advocated to move beyond this notion that a per capita income best captures what poverty is about. It's why UNDP 30 years ago started developing the Human Development Index uh, with the Human Development Report. Uh, in fact, in, in Oxford, um, there is a research center there with whom we work very closely together, you probably as well, on this issue of the multidimensional poverty concept. Understanding that poverty, um, as Amartya Sen also pointed out, is not just the absence of you know, physical goods or income. 
It is essentially about being able to fulfill human capabilities, to have agency, to exercise choices in your life. And I think a lot of what is beginning to preoccupy um, me and many others, I think, at this moment is that we have, and this is my point about the historical trend, we have a larger and larger number of people in this world who define themselves essentially by recognizing their society as being unfair. And this has nothing to do with per capita income. You know, it's unfairness at a higher level of per capita income, but a feeling of unjustness, of um, being deprived of opportunities. And think back to before the pandemic. Um, we were actually struggling worldwide with inequality already. We had riots, political reactions, political radicalization in the United States, in Hong Kong, in Chile, uh, in Paris. This was a phenomenon that I think has a lot to do with how poverty, inequality, and some of the phenomena you have described, Gabriela, um, essentially erode social cohesion and ultimately a society's belief or confidence in its own development pathway or how those who exercise power and on, on our behalf essentially decide. So this moment right now is an awful moment because we are being hit by already a great deal of tension within our societies, a pandemic on top of which has increased by 100 million plus. And now you are going to see just in the next few months, as Gabriela pointed out, many more people finding themselves below the poverty line. And let me add one last um, appeal also. In part, it is also in the way that we as an international community react or are not responding to this. Humanitarian support alone cannot alleviate poverty worldwide. <coughs> Afghanistan, Syria, the unresolved conflicts in which the international community opts not to um, look beyond a kind of lifeline approach of a drip, um, we actually become part of making the problem of poverty worse. Syria today has more than 95% of its people living below the poverty line. Afghanistan is in economic freefall, and by the middle or end of this year, 95% of Afghans will be living below the poverty line. This is a systemic failure of many different factors. Thank you. <laughs> I see you nodding. Um, so this is the occasion to say also that we are going to have a translation yes. because you are going to talk in Armenia. Yes, exactly. Um, so you can all take your, I guess, all of us uh, yes. translation. And thank you for that. And so I would like to ask you to tell us about your country uh, based on uh, th this first introduction. How are things today and how is the situation in Armenia um, after the pandemic and, and the war now? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the situation? Thank you very much. I prepare to speak in Armenia because it's really easy for me explaining my language is something philosophical idea my personally because I am a lecturer and I am an economist, my main professional, and I have a lot of chance to ask something about my students about poverty, about the role of international organizations. But now it's a time to ask you something, uh, see it with you. Thank you very much. Yes, Sharuna Kem Parunstein Neli Mitke. It's okay for you? Okay for you? Yeah, yes, it's good. Irakanum ani chortege unetsel Afghanistanum yev Syriaum shat mes hamar usutsan edi petke dini. Channel one, yeah. Yev khantir kayanum ederanum vor men Irakanum lava lava gwin tsan kutsunerum ein kantek ashkatan kter tanum, but et ashkatan kter i vercho in arzun kter chte vetsi ni chur mekan kan karum ein. Yev Irakanum mets khantir e dar tseli yerku yerku nerum el ashkatu chunu chipakaset. Democratakan Karkircha Satrecin, Savok Serti, Mikarbur Hangaman cover men carry behash which encourage Arzok, Ait Kaider or Katar Meditir Kanerum, Miras Napatakin has to maintain watch. I in Chur make Patkiras to make Love Kank, Vorakir Kank, Ortek Martik Narabutsun Kunanar Kartuchun Stanar, Vorakir Zaraitsun Nestanar, the rank terrain has to take watch. Ես համոզված եմ, որ ուսումնասիրության դեպքում կպարձի, որ այդ ամեն ինչը իրականություն չեն դարձել։ Եվ այստեղ կարծում եմ, բոլորս խնդիր ունենք։ Որտեվ շատ դեպքերում քաղաքական քայրերը ավելի կարևորում են, քան թե իրական կյանքում փոփոխությունները։ 
Բայց <gülüyor> որտեղ ժողովրդավարությունը շատ ավելի քիչ էր մենք մեր ճանապարհանտրեցինք ցավարե որ կարող եմ ասել որ մինչև հիմա մենք բարբերաբար ճգնաժամերի մեջ ենք հայտնվում բայց այդ ճգնաժամերը փորձում ենք հաղթահարել յուրահատուկ ձևով որտեղ մերը պայմանավորված է նրանը որ մենք փակ սահմաններ ունենք եւ մեր կյանքի որակի վրա դա իական ազդեցություն է ունենում Oskar gün me Türkiye ye vader bejani masin. Menk unenk mi çulutvats im nakhntir derne Qarabaği. Vor mes anantat konflikti mech e pamam mer Harevan Azerbaycani et tsavale e, bayts atpes e phasta. Ev entamene meku kes tare arach menk paterazmakan durch hakadrutsan mech eink. 44 soria paterazmi artsunkum i vercho համաձայնագիր ստորագրվեց որ պատերազմը դադարեցվի բայց կորուսները շատ մեծ էին եւ հիմա մենք նոր ճգնաժամի մեջ ենք բայց մենք կարող են մենք հաղթահարել այդ ճգնաժամը որտեղ մեր կողմից ընդունված ժողովրդավարական սկզբունքներն են մեզ դա ցույց տալիս ամենակարևոր խնդիրը որ կա ես կարող եմ ասել իշխանություն հասարակության հասարակություն հարաբերություններն են իշխանով է իշխանությունը հասարակությունը վստահում իշխանությանը եւ միս կոմիտ իշխանով է իշխանությունը հասկանում իր հասարակության խնդիրները եթե սա լինում է այս երկխոսությունը լինում է եւ աղքատության հարցնալուծվում եւ նոր ճգնաժամ լինելու հավանականությունն է քչանում Եվ երկիրը ավելի կայուն ու կառավարելի է լինում։ Բայց ամենակարևորը սկզբունքներին չդավաճանելն է։ Մեր երկրի փորձն է դա ցույց տվել։ Մինչև 2018 թվականը 2000 թվականից մեր երկիրը հրաժարվել էր համարա։ Ոչ ամբողջապես ամենայնիվս հիմնականում հրաժարվել էր այս ժողովրդական արժեքների ժողովրդավարական Եվ կորուպցիան ուղակի երկիր ուտում էր։ Եվ մենք հայտնվեցինք ծայրահեղ վատվիճակում։ Եվ 2018 թվականին Թավշա հեղափոխություն տեղի ունեցավ, որի արդյունքում երիտասարդ կառավարություն եկավ իշխանության, որը նոր շուն ճաղորդեց բոլորին։ Բիզնես ազատությունը զգաց մարտիկ ազատություն զգացին մարտիկ կարող են ազատ գործարարությամբ զբաղվել ոչ ոք չեր կարող իրենց խոչընդոտել գումարներ պահանջել քաղաքական ուժերը հնարավորություն ստանալ հավասար պայմանների մտրությունների մասնակցել եւ տնտեսությունը մի անգամից ունեցավ 7 ու 8 տոկոս աջ հաջորդ տարին գործարարները համոզվեցին որ պետությունը իրանց հետ ոչ թե ժամանակավոր խաղի կանոններով է աշխատում այլ ընդունված օրենքով կանոններով է աշխատում որը նշանակում էր հարկեր վճարել պարտաճանաչ եւ որոշ սոցիալական պարտավորություններ կատարել սա անթոր օրինակելի է օրինակ է որ կարող է բոլորին հետաքրքրել ես որպես մասնագետ ինքս գնահատում է որ կոռուպցիան կոռուպցիայի վերանալը շատ մեծ իմպուլս կտա 
բայց ազնում որեն ասեմ չէի պատկերացնում այդ աստիճան։ Սա լուրջ հանգամանք է։ Հատկապես միջազգային ընկերություններին, ովքեր տարբեր երկրներում շատ կարևոր աշխատանքներ են տանում։ Եվ որ այդ բոլոր գումարները, որ ծասում են երկրներում, դա իրենք հասնում են այն մարդկանցում, որ պետք է, այդեղ եվ աղկատությունը կպակասի և ռիսկերը կնվազեն և ամեն ինչ ավերի կարավարերի կրնի։ Իս եթե դա հասնում է մի խուբ մարդկանց, ովքեր ու կարծում եմ որինակներ դուք էր կարող եք բերեր։ Մի կարևոր խնդրանք ձեզ։ Եարկ է կան կաղաքական դրդապաճարներ, որ շատ դեպքերում մաչներիս պակում ենք։ Բայս չեմ կարծում, որ նման դեպքերում սա ճիշտլությու� Եվ նրանց էր մասնակիս դարնալ էդ բոլոր ծրագրերին, որտեմ միայն էդ ձովը հնարավոր հսկել։ Ես սա նաև մեր երկվի փորձից եմ ասում, իմ ազնական փորձից եմ ասում։ Ես ավարտեմ խոսկը սուղակի մի քիչ ավելի ներկայանա� Հայաստանի Հանրապետության մայրակաղաքի կաղաքապետ, չորս տարի։ Իրականում ես այդքան երկար տիչ կարողանայի կարավարեի, ես մարդկանց, մարդիկ ինս պտի չեն էրեին են անտաների պայմանդերի համար, որում իրեն կապրում էին � Երևանը մեկ միլուն անուս կաղաք է, ժամանակակից են թակարուցվասներով, խորութային միության ամենա գեղեցիկ ճարտարապետություն ունեցող կաղաքներից է, եմ միշտ բարցր համբավ է ունեցեր, որպես որակյար և գեղեցիկ ինձ եվ իմ թիմին, միայն մեկ պաճարով, մենք իրենց է տազնիվ խոսել ենք ուակի, անկաշկանդ, մենք ասել ենք, որ խնդիրը մերինա, մի ասինա, կարևոր չի ես կաղաքապետ եմ, իրենք կաղաքացի են, եկեք ճիշտ իրար Հաղաքապետ առանի պատվահանները չեն ճարդեր, թողոսներ չեն պակեր, միտինգներ չեն արեր, այլ ուղակի եղեն ենք մենք նույն գործ անողը։ Ես առայժում ես կանով, մարդեմ։ Ենք եվ եվ Um, a great description, uh, description about the importance of, of the political conditions, and I guess we can come back to that afterwards, but I first would like to give the floor to Mr. Stibbe about the infrastructure. You mentioned this uh, issue also, and you have been working as an investor through your impact yes. fund uh, uh, on, on this issue. Can you give us a few examples of actions that can help really to reduce poverty and also inequalities? Uh, thank you, Madeline. Uh, happy to be here in the forum. Uh, yes, in the past 10 years in Vital, we've been investing and developing, uh, uh, addressing actually these basic needs in high growth countries, meaning food, meaning water, mm -hmm. meaning health, uh, sustainable infrastructure, um, using technologies, for example, to, I, I think, to solve these problems of uh, high growth countries that are behind and the gaps that are only growing. Uh, we have to connect our values to our investments. And uh, for the past 10 years, we are from the beginning an impact investment fund. Uh, impact means intentional positive impact. Uh, 
the goal of the investment is to do impact as well as a market uh, rate and risk adjusted the profits and I think uh, today in the situation in the world we don't have the privilege not to do 100 percent uh, investments in order uh, according to our values and uh, and to measure it and to uh, and I, uh, there was uh, Steiner said uh, the SDGs gave us a f good framework of measuring and good framework of work so uh, I think in everything we do we address that I can give a few examples. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, seeing uh, India dry up, and due to climate change and due to the population growing, uh, we built a company called Vital Environment uh, to address to make sure that uh, thousands of villages get uh, safe water. And uh, together with the Indian government, who has really large schemes of irrigation schemes to use the water very uh, wisely and efficiently in, uh, and uh, give farmers uh, the ability to have more than one season a year. Uh, India, is, the scarcity of water is, com is completely crazy. It's, uh, in 2019, Chennai, 10 million people run out of water and trains start uh, bringing water in inside the city. So uh, it's, a, it's a great need to uh, manage uh, the, wa the water situation in a very uh, holistic way. We have a good, I, I personally, based in Israel, we have a good example. Israel is a scarce uh, water area, and we needed to solve it during the years. So uh, non-revenue water in Israel is extremely low. It's only 5% less. And uh, we recycle all the agriculture in the country, basically, is uh, uh, recycled water. We recycle 85% of the sewage. So everything is, is, is planned very wisely. And, uh, and it's a, it's a nice uh, pilot for the uh, world and the high growth countries that are now beginning to build the infrastructure. Uh, that will, things that we're trying to uh, do there. Another uh, example in agriculture is uh, uh, building agro-processing centers near the farmers in Africa, um, making the, basically, uh, transferring knowledge to the farmers around the center. They are the farmers bringing, again from Israel a bit, uh, the Moshav concept, community farming, having the uh, infrastructure, the heavy machinery or the processing centers owned by the community mm -hmm. uh, or, or owned by us as a private entity and we give credit and of inputs and then uh, trade with the farmers and we can show uh, great results of uh, 8x on the uh, 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 farmer's income uh, and farmers around the center uh, income is higher uh, uh, eight times than a normal farmer in the country. Um, yeah, we have uh, other examples of uh, technologies that can help uh, uh, putting communities, African communities, Mozambique projects under the World Bank that we're doing of digitizing land ownership basically giving people an asset, and their first asset. They can take loans on, they can take mortgage. It, it, bring, it basically puts them on the map mm -hmm. uh, of, of the economy, of the global economy. So addressing these b basic needs is what we do. And, uh, yes, and thank you. Um, Mr. Steiner, in the previous session this morning, you mentioned uh, the climate and digitation were either a threat or an opportunity, and we have nice examples here. Can you maybe uh, uh, build on that uh, and, and tell us how it can be used um, indeed to go into the right direction. Well, put very briefly on top of all the conditions that all my three panelists have just described, um, we also looked, um, because with UNDP, we, we, we also try to think very much about what, what is the future of development whole, because decisions taken today in part determine how resilient a society and economy will be tomorrow. So much of the focus, particularly when it comes to the UNDP's human development reports, has been to try and understand what is it that countries can do about this. And I'm sure we're going to speak more about this. And um, interesting, in 2019, the human development report, when it looked at inequality and, and how it was evolving, it also looked at the contemporary drivers. And the two that it identified that had the greatest relevance to what would happen to inequality turned out to be digitalization and climate change. And interesting enough, both of them holding within them the seeds of either making it much worse, i.e. an amplifier of inequality, 
or um, if you want a, uh, the opposite, uh, reducing inequality. And I think part of um, this applies as much to inequality as it does to poverty. And so we have spoken about a lot of the, the phenomena of poverty. I think, President, you alluded to it. Governance becomes a fundamental way in which you can tackle poverty. The symptoms you describe, Gabriela, in part are the products of choices to act, not to act, of certain policies, of whether we tax or do not tax, how we tax. Um, you know, a fossil fuel subsidy. I mean, we have this fascinating debate again right now. I mean, sometimes you do wonder whether we ever learn anything. <laughs> you know, here we are with a $120 uh, a barrel oil price. And what happens? We start debating again how we can bring the price down for a liter of, of gasoline at the petrol pump. This is the most inefficient, any economist, I hope you will agree with me, inefficient instrument that you can think of in terms of actually dealing with what is clearly a very disruptive um, increase in the cost of living, the theme of our panel. Mm. But we have learned over years, first of all, by subsidizing fossil fuel consumption, it's a regressive subsidy. I, the richest, who are the largest consumers proportionately, get the most money. So if you want to help the poor, you are really spending your money badly. Secondly, you're actually encouraging climate change to continue, which will again harm the poor uh, more badly. So governance policies um, are crucial in the way we apply them. But digital is an illustration also of what has, in a sense, become a, a realm of possibility. E-government, we spoke about it yesterday, can be a very significant way in, first of all, delivering services to citizens at much lower cost, something that many governments are extremely interested in because they are very constrained in their budgets. But it also opens up a whole new um, realm of, for example, um, inclusive finance. If we want to combat poverty, Remember, in many countries until recently, if you were poor, the banking system simply did not want to know about you. You had no collateral, you had no address, you had no credit history. Don't come to our branch. I lived for 10 years in Kenya. I, I lived alongside the you know, emergence of what is called M-Pesa. Some of you may have heard mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. An extraordinary revolution that, interesting enough, of digital payment platforms ultimately was allowed to succeed because the central bank governor at the time decided that a phone company service provider would be allowed to have financial, um, I mean, basically money in their accounts overnight. Because normally that's, you know, regulatory rules, banks can only do that. The central bank Kenya took a deliberate decision to allow this to happen and a revolution uh, followed where, you know, women today Young people can transact at virtually no cost in the financial system. They are part of it. You can actually borrow money in the morning to buy your produce on the wholesale market, take it to your local market, sell it and repay your loan all on the cell phone. This is the revolution that digital technologies can, can provide. So I think we have many solutions. They begin with the kind of society we choose to be. Our taxation system often is an expression of that. Um, and it is then very deliberate, poverty eradication, inequality reducing policies that look at life from the vantage point of a poor person rather than the rich person who is simply concerned about how do I avoid these people starting to go out on the streets and, and maybe rioting. It is a slightly caricatured way, but unfortunately our poverty discussions sometimes are very much characterized by who we are and where we live in a moment like this. <laughs> Thank you. We will uh, have a few minutes for questions. If you, yes, please. Thank you so much. I'm Alexis Taylor. I'm a global shaper from Austin, Texas in the US. And one of my questions is around the global wealth tax. There's been more people calling for that as a potential solution to start addressing inequality. And I'm wondering if we had a global wealth tax today and we had that funding, where should it be spent and are redistributed to have the most impact on the challenges that we are talking about in this session? Thank you so, very much. Yes, and thank you, Alexis, for asking that question because I would have wanted to go into the tax and as I, uh, building on what the panelists have said, you know, these are questions of political will, of choice, mm -hmm. and it's inequality is not inevitable and we have multiple examples here. So taxing is, is one of them. And wealth taxation can be also a choice in, per country rather than waiting and, uh, for a global 
wealth taxation agreement like the one we've had for corporate taxation. So st starting, and, and we calculated in our report so if for taxation at 2% um, for individual wealth, going up to 5% um, for billionaires, so looking at raising uh, with those small percentages, we can raise uh, 2.5 uh, trillion dollars, uh, which would be enough to lift 2.3 billion people out of poverty, deliver universal health care and social protection for everyone living in low and lower middle income countries. So nearly half the world. And that's what we can do with those low percentages. If we have the political will, that's in, uh, calculating if all countries did it uh, at that level at the same time, which is totally doable and, and given the, the scale of the crisis. But it requires, of course, social dialogue and agreements and, and transparency and many elements. Thank you, Mr. President. I will, speak, I will continue in Armenia. Oh. If Kaila and Tanapis, Mikomit, Temen Kargering, each stone, the Manankor, Miss Hanara Vurzunchenk Talunev, Gumar Nerhavakel, Kam Bartas Neru de Kuma with the Gist, Menk Akan Kalle were met Gumar Ner Petkat and Kensera Gedim Murunk Petka Katutsun Pakasas name. Yes, get to remember Ravadi, Karevur and Tanapis, Archuna with Sam Bartas Manharsak and Narkid. If Avedi Lurch can narkil, a cut to some pajarnere. Say Motskas Munka in her say, Selims Bauer, a cut to San Hartarman Hantinerov. A cut to soon hit Evanka. A pet kite hit Evanka Pajar get Nelinchi hit Evanka. A sink may a crumb satter as Katanki Arta Droga comes and hit Evanka. I think that the government of the United States is a very important thing to do. If you have a government of the United States, you can't get a government of the United States. You can't get a government of the United States. You Եվ ես առումով ես մի քիչ զգուշությամբ եմ վերաբերում այդ հարկատեսակին։ Իհարկե ծանոթ չեմ այդ հաշվետությանը, որ կա Օքսֆորմի կողմից, ինձ հետաքիր է։ Անձամբ ես գնայեմ։ Եվ մի գուցե կգրեմ նաև ձեզ իմ տեսակետները։ Արդեն որպես տնտեսագետ եմ ես խոսում, ես խոսակցությունը իմ նախագահական պաշտոնի հետ կապ չունի։ Որտեվ սենք իրար հետ շատ փոխկապակցված են։ This is a inflation problem. The problem is that the Այս մենք դրան է պատրաստ չենք, հիմա պատերազմական կամ այս համաշխարհային ցնցումների դեպքում եւ որ սննդամթերքի, նավթի եւ մնացածի գները բարձրացան, սա այլ լրացուցիչ էր։ Մենք այսինքն մեր գործողությունների ինչ էր, COVID-ը վերացնենք, եկեք մարդկանց օգտենք, գումարներ տանք, հետո ինչ կրնի։ Մենք պատրաստենք, որ 1 տարի կամ COVID-ը անվերջ պետք է չլինի, 2 տարի հետո մենք պետք է այդ ամենիչը մեր վրա զգանք։ I was able to get a lot of people who Thank you very much. My name is Ndidi Okonkongwuneli. I'm a social entrepreneur. I work in the food and agricultural landscape in Africa. And uh, thank you for your comments and for your work. I have one comment and one question. The comment is, um, I've started an initiative after working for 25 years called Changing Narratives Africa. 
because it really uh, makes me very sad when we paint the picture of Africa as a hungry child yeah. um, because it's a single story. Um, so I'm just appealing to my brothers and sisters on the stage to be very careful about the narratives you paint because when we do try to change them, we're often seen as actors who don't have agency and who can deliver impact in our own backyard. So it's just a nuanced, and I'll be happy to talk offline. Now the question is, a lot of um, sessions I've gone to is around how can we help with relief, there's an emerging food crisis, and I'm curious whether any of you have seen studies that measure the impact of interventions post uh, relief, because oftentimes it distorts uh, the local food ecosystem and actually makes prices rise for the uh, rest of the population and drives them into poverty. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting very concerned about some of the interventions I'm hearing being touted around in the global arena. So that's one question I'll have for you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Maybe, Mr. Uh, Shibe, you could, you could start on that one. Yeah. I know you want to measure the impact of your actions. And, and we do. We do measure uh, the outcomes and the outputs of uh, everything we do. We can uh, show that uh, our, for example, we uh, poultry in Angola, we built an ag agro-processing center that did 20% of the production. We know to say that 60% went to uh, of the eggs sold went to the lowest uh, uh, part of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do measure that. We do measure our beneficiaries. Who is the beneficiary? And we do, uh, and we can show that uh, results in everything we do. One comment on tax. I, uh, from from my, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, have the chance uh, earlier. Um, from my point of view, as the, the developer investor in the field, uh, I'm, I'm always for more, uh, more resources, but I think also when uh, institutional resources need to understand they need to take more risk as they see it now, because if they won't take more, it's actually more risky not to invest in these places. And if COVID taught us something that uh, solving uh, problems in uh, in developing countries is solving problems also for the world and where everything is connected. So I think uh, that collect, collect more taxes is good, but make, the, uh, make it efficient, as you said, and, and uh, let I know, people on ground yeah. and take risks on people on ground yeah. and because my bottleneck is funding and I don't think that, uh, uh, well, that's one example for, for that. So. Uh, taking more risk with the f with the taxes and with the f institutional money we have. Uh, a few more examples of uh, of measurement. Uh, if you, you you want to address. I think. Yeah. Yes. Relief. Yeah. Could yeah. I so. respond? Uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I just Sorry. wanted. I agree very much with your issue of the single story. Um, and um, in, when I was in Somalia, as I said, six weeks ago, I met lots of entrepreneurs, and you know, huge dynamic uh, scene. At the same time, I feel it's morally important to express the suffering that is there and the need for for solidarity. But the investment, and we also launched a report last week called Dangerous Delays. The point is to prevent and uh, Save the Children in Oxfam together uh, published that report and we know how to do it and we have done it uh, together with uh, very much um, uh, local organizations that are uh, very well placed to do it themselves, but it's a partnership. So that is the, the types of investments we all want to do. When the taxation that I was talking about is new wealth taxation. So at the moment of all the taxation in the world, only 4% is wealth taxation. And, and so we're of individuals. And that is an un untapped resource in all countries, including even Somalia, which may be one of the poorest, but everywhere there is inequality and there's possibility of wealth taxation. So it's a question of decisions by countries and it's yeah. not to be imposed in any way, but it's an opportunity given the, the situation in which we are. And then of course other measures to help address in the urgency. We need to think long term as has been discussed, but also now what do people need, like uh, eliminating VAT on, on food because we, we, we need to make sure that, um, that uh, people can access uh, and those, you know, VAT is not a progressive measure. So we need to have progressive taxation, which in itself reduces inequality. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we are um, out of time. <laughs>
it went very quickly. Uh, very uh, big issues, of course, and we see that there's still some discussions about the solutions, of course, but I will quote one of you saying, it all begins with the societies we choose to be. Um, so thank you very much for your participation and uh, have a nice uh, evening. Thanks, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.